Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the introduction. Uh, I appreciate the honor uh, for the ASBMB from Avanti Lipids. Um, I'm very honored to win this award, honored to be in the company of people like George and others that have won this award. Um, I accept the award on uh, behalf of the work we've done and in particular on behalf of all the people that I've worked with over the years and uh, most notably um, uh, on behalf of my scientific partner uh, Toby Walters sitting down here. Um, it's now been about half my career that Toby and I have been partners uh, in science and for the last two years we've run a joint lab together at Harvard and uh, we basically share everything in science now so this award is very much shared with you Toby so thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about lipid storage and the molecular mechanisms of lipid storage in particular triacylglycerols. And triacylglycerols as you know um, organisms don't always have the luxury of having energy available so triacylglycerols are the, the universal molecular storage form of energy and that's because these are long chain hydrocarbons that are highly reduced. Uh, they don't require water for their storage, so they can be stored in oil uh, without water. And nearly all cells have, all eukaryotic cells have the capacity to store these, uh, these lipids. And in particular, dipocytes are professional cells that storing uh, lipids such as triacylglycerols. And in fact, it's really rather remarkable. Adipocytes in our body can store enough energy so that we can literally live weeks without energy um, just through these efficient means of energy storage. Um, there are implications of triglyceride storage. There are biomedical implications. Of course, tri excess triglyceride storage is at the root of obesity and associated diseases like type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease. And in addition, on the flip side, there are a lot of people interested in trying to feed the world and power the world, and so they're trying to develop uh, industrial applications to make more triacylglycerols or more oils. Now triglycerides in cells are, are stored in an organelle called the lipid droplet, which is shown on, uh, in an electron micrograph on the left here from a hepatoma cell. And lipid droplets are uh, a region of phase separation in the cell where oil droplets, neutral lipids such as triacylglycerides or uh, cholesterol esters or ether lipids are stored in the cores of uh, these droplet organelles and they're bounded by a surface phospholipid monolayer typically reflecting a uh, composition that's similar to the endoplasmic reticulum and they're decorated by specific proteins, often metabolic proteins that carry out specific functions at the surface of these droplets. As I mentioned, lipid droplets are found in nearly all eukaryotic cells. They have the capacity to, they can be detected by neutrolipid dyes such as bodipi as you see here for yeast cells, fly cells, and mouse cells. And in addition, lipid droplets feature prominently and triglycerides feature prominently in many physiological processes. I've mentioned adipose tissue storage. Uh, lipid droplets are involved in foam cell formation and atherosclerosis, fatty liver disease. Milk production is a very interesting phenomenon of secretion of lipid droplets. Um, and of course, fat absorption in the small intestine. So the central question that we've been interested in for, for many years now is how do cells make triglycerides and how do they store them in these organelles? And that's what I'll tell you briefly about today, what we've learned about this um, in, in recent uh, years. So going back though, if we look back at the, um, the discovery of triglycerides themselves, best I can tell triglycerides were discovered around 1815 to 1820 and some of the major contributions came from this gentleman, Michel Eugène Chevreux, and he was an organic chemist and was interested in identifying the components of fats and used the modification, excuse me, to take apart the fats and describe that triglycerides were composed, uh, or fats at that point, were composed of fatty acids and glycerin. And this was the monograph that he published. And it was quite amazing work, actually, all the different things that, that uh, this gentleman discovered and many of the common names that we use to describe fatty acids and so forth came from this time period. But then it was about 140 years before we begin to understand how triglycerides are made. And that, uh, the big breakthrough came uh, around 1960, I think it is, um, 1959, actually the year I was born. And this was uh, work done by Eugene Kennedy and co-workers uh, who, who deciphered 
did various uh, glycerolipid synthesis pathways that make different glycerolipids, such as phospholipids, but also neutrolipids, such as triisoglycerols, and published uh, this paper, for example, on the biochemical activity that they isolated in membranes that give rise to triglycerides via this reaction, in which a diacylglycerol was covalently joined with a long-chain fatty acyl-CoA. The CoA is lost in the reaction, and triglycerides are formed, and the enzyme was called acyl-CoA diacylglycerol acyltransferase, or DGAT. And then it was a number of, uh, of decades, actually, before we began to understand more molecular aspects of how you make triglycerides. A lot of people tried to purify DGAT enzymes. is a very difficult thing to do, and, and a lot of people had little success. We got into the picture uh, at this point very much via serendipity. Um, so this is, uh, you know, you don't seem to have what I'm not looking for. Okay, so I like that one. I'm still looking for better serendipity cartoons. But anyway, we were, uh, we were actually not looking for uh, DGAT enzyme. We were involved, as, as mentioned in the introduction, in studying cholesterol esterification in ACAT enzymes. And T.Y. Chang at Dartmouth had cloned the first ACAT enzyme, and we were involved in, in, in elucidating other members of the gene family. And um, not well you can see that over there, it seems dark. But uh, basically, we were expressing different uh, constructs in insect cells and looking at the lipid extracts uh, from membranes incubated with different substrates. And we noticed that uh, ACAT was on the right and made a lot of cholesterol esters uh, on the left as a control. But in the middle is the gene that we were, we were interested in, and it didn't seem to make much triacylglycerol. But we noticed. Um, really just one of those really exciting times in a lab meeting where there's a darker spot where you don't expect it, and that was in the triglyceride band. At this point, we, this is not something we'd studied, not something we'd look, we were looking for, but you know, we quickly went to the biochemistry textbooks and we realized that the reaction was very similar to the reaction we were looking at. In other words, ACAT enzymes use the hydroxyl group of cholesterol to make cholesterol esters, and di DGAT enzymes make the hydroxyl group of diacylglycerol to make triglycerides. And so we uh, had identified by serendipity the first DGAT uh, enzyme, and, and it was called DGAT1. The DGAT1 gene was a is a member of a, a medium-sized gene family called the MBOAT family. That stands for membrane-bound o transferases. And these are a collection of different enzymes that acylate lipids or proteins in some instances. And they include the ACAT enzymes, as you see, and they also include uh, the ghrelin acyltransferase and um, some other uh, interesting uh, things, such as porcupine, that acylate um, wind proteins. Um, so we had identified DGAT1, and then within a couple years, actually, uh, Kathy Lardazabal and, and Tony Volker, who were working at CalGene and trying to genetically modify plants, succeeded in purifying a DGAT enzyme from a fungus, and that they called DGAT2. And they called us up, and it turned out DGAT2 had no sequence identity uh, with DGAT1. It was a completely different gene family, which had seven members in humans. And the DGAT2, ends, it's called the DGAT2 family since that's the founding member, but it includes the MGAT enzymes as well as some wax synthase uh, enzymes, and we worked on some of these enzymes over the years. So we have these two DGAT enzymes, DGAT1 and DGAT2, that basically catalyze a, the same reaction um, but, are com but are in different gene families. So this is an example of convergent evolution. And we don't yet know that much about the molecular structure of these enzymes. We know a little bit about the topologies from a variety of studies that have been done by our labs and others over the years, but they're very different enzymes. Uh, DGAT1 is a much larger enzyme, has multiple transmembrane domains uh, with its N and C terminus on opposite sides of the endoplasmic reticulum. And DGAT2, in contrast, has both uh, the N and C termini on the cytosolic face and just has this one hairpin uh, portion of the protein that's embedded in the bilayer. DGAT1 also can esterify a variety of substrates, whereas DGAT2 primarily esterifies diacylglycerol to form triglycerides. And when we knocked out these genes in mice, we also found that they were very different enzymes. So the first knockout that we did was the DGAT1 knockout, and this was quite interesting. Uh, we got a viable mouse. It had reduced body fat. Uh, delays in fat absorption, although it still absorbed all the fat that it ate, but just in a, in a slower manner. They have increased energy expenditure. They were, they were resistant to diet-induced obesity, hepatic steatosis, insulin resistance, and so forth, and they're lean mice that live about 25% longer. So needless to say, this was an attractive target to the pharmaceutical company. I'll come back to that. In contrast, when we knocked out DGAT2, we got a completely different result. We got much more what one might have expected. And that was a mouse that didn't survive long after birth, 
has more than 95 per, 95% reduction in triglycerides and also is deficient in a number of essential fatty acids and therefore it has a skin defect and it rapidly loses water and becomes dehydrated. And we know from doing double genetic knockout experiments that these two enzymes account for the vast majority of triglyceride synthesis in mammals. Uh, this, shows, uh, this shows a dipsite differentiation done in MEFs from either wild-type mice, where you can see the oil red O-staining, and lots of lipid droplets, or DGAT double knockout mice, and there's no lipid droplets and, and no lipid accumulation at all. So this, this, uh, at this point, we understood a bit about how triglycerides are made, and triglycerides, after all, are oils. And one thing Toby and I have come to appreciate is that when you start trying to understand now how oils are stored in cells, basically uh, oils follow many of the same principles that you, that you find, of course, in emulsion physics. So they have duetting, they have budding, they have fusion, fission, surface tension, and so forth. And the big question is, how does a, how does a cell take these oils made by these enzymes, presumably within the ER bilayer now, and make an organelle, an, an area of phase separation in the cell that, that has specific functions and specific proteins target on it. And that's been occupying our work together a, a lot over the last 10 years. So we realized that in trying to unravel some of this, we would, need to, uh, we would need to identify the molecular and protein machinery that's involved. And we set out on a number of unbiased screens to try to identify some of those, those proteins. And so one of the things we did early on in our work together was to do an RNAi screen. Uh, and we did that in Drosophila cells. We, we screened the whole genome. We found a couple hundred genes that had really significant effects on lipid droplet storage and morphology. And they binned out into different phenotypes and have kept us occupied um, for some time since in, in terms of understanding um, their mechanisms. But this is quite informative. And the other thing that's been quite informative is quantitative proteomics, which uh, Toby has become expert with uh, from his time uh, in associated with, association with Matthias Mann uh, in Germany. And basically, we've uh, surveyed lipid droplet proteomes in a quantitative way to find out what's enriched in lipid droplets and begin to understand what's the molecular machinery uh, that governs droplet behavior. So let me tell you a little bit of what we've learned. Um, one of the key things that we've learned is that there are really two kinds of lipid droplets. So much like there are different kinds of lipoproteins that circulate in your plasma, in cells there are two kinds of lipid droplets. The first, uh, in, in the sequence, that we, in our model anyway, is lipid droplets that are the product of ER triglyceride synthesis, for example, by the DGAT1 enzyme. And we call these uh, initial lipid droplets, or ILDs, and I'll refer to them as ILDs. And all cells have the capacity to do this. In addition, it seems that most cells have the capacity to do to make a larger lipid droplet that uh, is characterized by the presence of enzymes such as DGAT2 or GPAT4, so enzymes of the triglyceride synthesis pathway that localize from the ER onto the surface of these droplets and locally catalyze triglyceride synthesis to sort of expand the droplets once they're already formed. And so we call these ELDs or expanding lipid droplets. And these ILDs are approximately 3 to 500 nanometers in diameter, and these are often 1 to 2 microns or greater in diameter. And this is an example, uh, just to show you some data that supports this, that if you look in S2 cells, for example, over a time course of loading cells with fatty acids, there is one population shown here in black that doesn't change size over time, and there's another population that is characterized by the presence of these TG synthesized enzymes that at about somewhere between three to eight hours starts expanding and becoming these ELD population. And we can actually push those populations in one direction or another by expressing the DGAT enzymes. So this is S2 cells again with, uh, here's control cells where you have a mixed population of lipid droplets, but if you overexpress DGAT1, the ER-based system, you get lots of these small ILDs. If you overexpress DGAT2, you, get, uh, you convert them to more of these larger ELDs. So there are two types of lipid droplets, uh, at least, that we call ILDs and ELDs. Now the next question is, how do, how do we form ILDs from the endoplasmic reticulum? And here I'm going to show you briefly some unpublished work that uh, we hope will be published soon, where we think we begin to understand uh, some aspects of a molecular player. So in cells, uh, the formation of lipid droplets appears to be highly organized. Probably no surprise that nature has an organization system to uh, 
carry out the formation of droplets. And basically what you see is if you, as you load cells with oleate over time, there becomes a threshold where you get phase separation and you see that you can detect lipid droplets um, with one of a couple different probes that are shown here. Um, we use either uh, Bodipi dye uh, or any of the other neutral lipid dyes. Or we and others have developed protein probes. We have one we call live drop that's made with a short uh, hairpin segment from GPAP4 that seems that we know localizes and identifies uh, very, in a very sensitive manner all collections, uh, all new collections of lipid droplets, all lipid droplets in the cell. Okay, so lipid droplet normally happens in a coordinated manner. What proteins might be involved in this? So one protein that we and others have been quite interested in is a protein called SAPIN. Uh, there's been a lot of work done in SAPIN by these laboratories down here. And from that kind of work, we know, uh, we know quite a bit about SAPIN in, in terms of its characteristics. Mutations in SAPIN cause congenital uh, generalized lipodystrophy. So that is part of what piqued interest in um, SAPIN has been shown by Joel Goodman's lab to homo oligomerized form a toroid type structure, and SAPIN uh, localizes in yeast to ER lipid, lipid droplet junctions. And the reason that SAPIN came to people's attention is that if you delete SAPIN, you get a supersized abnormal lipid droplet phenotype in yeast, and then this piqued interest in, in whether SAPIN was involved somehow in lipid droplet um, formation. And so, on, uh, so what happens when you delete SAPIN in... Um, S2 cells, which we use as, a, as, a, as, a, as one of our study systems. So I've already shown you this video on the left, which shows you uh, basically how lipid droplets uh, are formed in a rather coordinated manner. Now, in the absence of SAPIN, we some, see something quite different. And so what we see is there were some preformed lipid droplets, but you can see that there are many uh, foci that do not that are not detected by Bodipi, but are detected by this live drop probe, and they're scattered throughout the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, as if they're small collections of triglycerides uh, when SAPIN is not there. And <clears throat> this phenomenon uh, I just showed you for S2 cells. So here's control, where you have uh, large droplets that are detected by Bodipi and live drop, but in, in SAPIN knockdowns, you have a, accumulation of these live drop foci that do not, are not detected by Bodipi. Um, we also made um, <clears throat> use CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to knock out SAPIN in, in some cells, a memory carcinoma cell line. We find the same thing, a collection of these live drop foci that seem to be small collections of triglyceride. And the same is true of human fibroblasts that come from SAPIN deficient patients. So what are these uh, foci? So we looked by electron microscopy and the, uh, the, on the left is, a, is, is EM from a wild type uh, cell from the some cells and basically you see lipid droplets which are what we typically see often near the endoplasmic reticulum and we see many of these small, much smaller droplet appearing structures in SAPIN knockout cells. Um, but, and our presumption was that these are uh, within the ER bilayer somehow, and they, they represented lenses that had failed to bud. However, we had a surprise. We did uh, electron tomography in collaboration with, the, uh, with our collaborators at Yale, and what this uh, electron um, tomogram shows is this is one of these small lipid droplets. It's less than 200 nanometers. It, it, here's another one down here. They're almost always in, uh, associated with uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, but they're not lenses within the bilayers. In fact, they're very small droplets that appear to have budded from the bilayer, um, but, are, but, are, but are much smaller than we're used to seeing in terms of uh, in the wild type cells. And so we think these are nascent lipid droplets that have budded from the ER but failed to mature. And uh, in this, uh, this is a 3D reconstruction from one of these tomograms in which you see one of these what we call nascent lipid droplets that is is in close proximity to the ER bilayer, and uh, there's even the suggestion of electron density that there might be um, uh, that's reminiscent of contacts between the, the, the organelles. Okay, so that's what happens when SAPIN is absent. Now the question is, what is SAPIN doing normally? And to address this problem, we uh, use CRISPR-Cas9 engineering to tag the endogenous SAPIN in some cells. And in contrast to uh, a diffuse signal in the ER, like you see for SEC61 in red here, 
what we see for sapin is, is uh, foci, puncti that are, that, are, that are scattered throughout the ER. We estimate that each of these uh, <clears throat> sapin foci contains somewhere between 20 and 45 uh, molecular units of sapin. And these foci are highly mobile within the endoplasmic reticulum. This, so uh, I'm not sure if it's projecting well, but basically what you see is the sapin foci are tracking along the tubules as if they're scanning the ER for, uh, for neutral lipids. And in fact, what we see and can catch in some instances is that different collections of neutral lipids, live drop foci, will interact with a sapin focus, and then they become co-localized, and then the droplet starts to grow. And that's shown in this movie here, where we're tracking one live drop uh, fo focus. It comes in contact with a sapin focus, and then starts to grow. And we have numerous instances of this, and it's shown in individual images below. And so this has led us to a model where we think we begin to have some insight into what sapin does molecularly. And that is that triglycerides are made by DGAD enzymes. We, you, we believe then what happens after triglyceride synthesis is that nascent lipid droplets are formed. These are typically less than 200 nanometers. They're in close proximity to the ER, possibly through some kind of contact that's mediated by other proteins. We have no direct evidence for that yet, except that they're located close to the ER. And then we believe that sapin is important in most likely allowing the transfer of neutral lipids to, to grow and mature these nascent lipid droplets into what we call ILDs. In the absence of sapin, what we think we see is the buildup of intermediates. So instead of seeing the progression from nascent lipid droplets to mature ILDs, we see a collection of these nascent lipid droplets that seem to get stalled out at that point. Okay, so that was some insight that we've had recently into the formation initially of lipid droplets and the role of sapin. The, another question is how do you get these expanding lipid droplets that I mentioned? And I'm, a lot of this work is published. So I'm just going to briefly review it. This happens much later when you load cells with oleate. Um, so that's shown here. Here's a collection of, of, of ILDs, or lipid droplets that are, that are smaller, six hours into a time course. And basically what happens at six hours is suddenly one of the droplets uh, um, acquires a GPAP4 enzyme as detected by this probe, which is one of the triglyceride synthesis enzymes, and starts expanding. So expanding lipid droplets occur much later. And how do these enzymes get there? Basically, we have the evidence suggests that these enzymes migrate from the endoplasmic reticulum onto the surfaces of ILDs to convert them to ELDs. And you can see this by fluorescence microscopy here, showing an ER uh, lipid droplet membrane bridge, and you can see that in the tomogram here. And we've false colored this here so you can see where the ER lumen is and these numerous connections between the ER bilayer and the surface monolayer lipid droplets that we believe allows the migration of these enzymes onto the surface. And summarizing a number of papers and many years of hard work, basically we think the schema is something like this. Um, you make triglycerides, sapin's involved in making the nascent, and then the mature ILDs. And the ILDs are converted into ELDs. There's a step that I won't show you the data for, but we believe that the ARF1 COP1 proteins, which are involved in making vesicles for vesicular transport, are also have a role in lipid droplet biology, and that is they pinch off monolayer uh, bound small nano droplets of 60 to 80 nanometers. By doing so, they remove phospholipids, increase the surface tension. We think that's probably what's required to allow these membrane connections that I showed you uh, in that last tomogram. Once the ER lipid droplet connections are established, then there's migration of enzymes like DGAT2 and GPAT4 to the surface of these lipid droplets where they can catalyze localized TG synthesis. And then finally, that creates a deficit in PC, synthesis, PC on the surface, which you need as a surfactant. And if there is sufficient enough PC deficiency on the surface, then there's a binding of the CCT enzyme, the rate-limiting step for PC biosynthesis, through an amphipathic helix to the surface of lipid droplets. This activates CCT and activates the PC synthesis pathway, so the cell generates more PC to coat these lipid droplets. Okay, so in the last couple minutes, let me just turn now to uh, what are the roles of these lipids droplet systems in physiology. So why have two enzymes? Why have ILDs and ELDs? Okay, so to look at this, we, one, of the, one of the areas we've looked at is adipose tissue, and, and, and there was a finding that prompted our interest, and that is if we looked at 
the regulation of DGAT2, uh, it does as you might expect. It's relatively low in fasting and it goes up in refeeding. However, if you look at DGAT1, you have a paradox because this enzyme is relatively high in fasting and goes down in refeeding, not what you would expect necessarily for a triglyceride synthesis enzyme. So this prompted us to ask, uh, it's known that you know, when you hydrolyze fats during lipolysis, you re-esterify a lot of them. Which of these enzymes might be important in re-esterifying triglycerides during lipolysis, DGAT1 or DGAT2? The previous data I showed you suggests that it might be DGAT1 since that goes up in fasting, and fasting, of course, is a state when lipolysis is active. And so we had a look at that in adipocytes, and we can set up culture conditions so that we have uh, adipocytes. These are bodipistane lipid droplets. And now if you induce lipolysis, you see the formation of many, many small droplets, new ILDs that are formed uh, under, adipocyte, under conditions of lipolysis if you don't put albumin in the media to accept those fatty acids, they're re-esterified. Uh, and then if you use a DGAT1 inhibitor, you, you abolish the formation of those ILDs, and the DGAT2 inhibitor basically has no effect. So this tells us that during lipolysis, when you're hydrolyzing all these fatty acids, they appear to go back to the ER where DGAT1 re-esterifies re them to form ILDs. And in agreement with that, if we do biochemical studies where we look at fatty acids released into the media during lip lipolysis conditions, if you inhibit DGAT1, the amount going into the media increase. If you inhibit DGAT2, nothing happens, and the combination looks a lot like DGAT1. So this leads to the idea then that basically during lipolysis, particularly in adipose tissue, DGAT1 is re-esterifying a good, a good um, portion of the fatty acids that are released uh, from uh, lipolyzed uh, triglycerides. So this, asked, this prompted us to ask, what's the function of that? And uh, the, our hypothesis was that if you don't have DGAT1, then this may lead to lipotoxic stress for the endoplasmic reticulum because they can't esterify these fatty acids. So we've looked at that in cultured adipocytes, and uh, indeed this is what we found. So the, this is the basal state. Now we're looking at a couple markers of ER stress, uh, BIP and CHOP. And these four lanes are in induced lipolysis. This is a thapsogargan control. And then this is the DGAT1 inhibitor, where you can see you also get a robust activation of, 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 of these uh, markers of ER stress, whereas D, DGAT2 inhibition, you don't see as much activation. And it also appears to be true in vivo. We have uh, DGAT1 knockout mice. This is an adipose-specific knockout mouse uh, for DGAT1. And in, fast, in a prolonged fast, we see evidence of ER stress in these mice if they don't have DGAT1 as you can see on these Western blots. Um, the consequences of this are that uh, the, there is ER stress and associated with that in the adipose tissue of these mice, there are increased, uh, increased levels of markers of macrophages and uh, inflammation. So we believe that, that the DGAT1 is helping to protect the fat during lipolysis, uh, prolonged lipolysis. So that leads uh, one to one model where we think that part of the formation of, of lipid drop, the ILD formation, is to protect the ER from lipotoxic stress, whereas DGAT2 and these other enzymes that form expanding lipid droplets really have a primary role in providing large amounts of fat storage. In agreement with this, DGAT1 deficiency in humans um, yields a rather severe phenotype, and that is we collaborated uh, several years ago with uh, colleagues at Mass General Hospital to identify several children who have DGAT1 deficiency, and they have a congenital diarrheal syndrome that comes on a couple days after birth and is worsened by fat intake, and they have intestinal enterocyte dysfunction um, consistent with lipotoxic injury. Um, so it turns out that, as I mentioned, there are a lot of inhibitors made for DGAT1 based on the beneficial effects in mice, but inhibitors for DGAT1 in humans have run into the same problem that the genetic DGAT1 deficiency is that people that take these inhib inhibitors get diarrhea in a dose-related manner, and it's exacerbated by fat intake, which has limited their, their efficacy in therapeutic trials. Uh, more recently, there have been inhibitors for DGAT2 that have been developed, and uh, they're still in the pipeline, so we'll see whether they turn out to be beneficial. So what I've told you today is I think, you know, we started with this basic process of trying to understand how triglycerides are made and how they're stored in droplets. And we begin now, through our work and the work of others in the field, to begin to understand some of the molecular machinery that regulates this process in cells so that it all works, so that we can store energy as we need it, get energy back out as we need it, and so forth. And of course, in disease processes, some of this might go wrong. 
So the highlights are that cells have spatially segregated TG synthesis pathways. The different pathways result in different lipid droplet types that we call ILDs and ELDs. ILD growth and maturation at the ER is mediated by proteins, such as sapin appears to be one of the proteins involved in the growth of uh, these nascent lipid droplets, and that the different pathways have different functions in lipid storage and ER protection from lipotoxic stress. So with that, I'll close. The, this slide lists the contributors uh, to, the, to the work that I've shown you today, including our current lab members and our past lab members that have contributed to this. Um, a variety of collaborators that we've worked with, including the Yale Microscopy Corps, uh, various collaborators at, at Harvard that have helped us with microscopy and screens and genetics. Christer Ising, who is the recipient of the uh, Shaw Young Investigator Award, who's helped us with all the lipidomics. And so thanks to all those people for this work. Uh, for myself, I personally just want to thank uh, the tens, if not almost hundreds, of people that I've worked with over the years that have helped um, and too many to name, but I'm deeply appreciative for all their work on this. Uh, in addition, I just want to take one second to uh, acknowledge I've had many mentors over the years, but these three were formative in my development as a scientist. Bob Eckel, who got me interested in science uh, when I was a medical resident at the University of Colorado. Stephen Young, who I trained with as a postdoctoral fellow and somehow had confidence in me with no experience to knock out apolipoprotein genes. And uh, finally, Peter Walter, whom uh, I did a sabbatical with uh, approximately 11 years ago, which really kind of changed the direction of my science uh, in large part because I happened to sit down next to Toby. And uh, last but not least, I just want to say a final uh, thank you to Toby. I have uh, now was counting up. I've run a lab for 22 years, and the past uh, 11 years have been in, in partnership with Toby, and the last two years have been in running a joint lab together. And uh, I'm deeply appreciative that uh, Toby makes me a better scientist, and he he makes the joy of discovery quite fun, so I'm glad to be on the journey with you. Thank you.